about we need people to join us for trunk or treat for the town. Well, we had four folks show up and they showed up like that. So we said we have another job for you. So we have a band of banditos with us this morning. Banditas, actually. So welcome to worship this morning. This is the service where we have a little fun and also a really important message for you this morning. So it's a little of both. Because I believe that God is happy when we are happy. So there's no reason not to be joyous as we share love and a message with one another. We have two sets of flowers this morning. Flowers from the King family on the altar and flowers in memory of Tracy Johnson's dad down below. I have to ask, are there any first time visitors here this morning? This is always the day I hope the answer is no. But it's the <laughs> only day. It's the only day I ever feel that way. So it's not like this every week, but it's always warm and friendly. Uh, we have 
big surprise, a Halloween party after the service today, downstairs for the kids. So there's, you've seen it if you came through that way, it's going to be an amazing event for them, thanks to Caprice and her helpers. Um, next Sunday, we will be observing All Saints Day. Um, we do it on the Sunday after because that's a more serious service and we don't feel like it combines with what we do today. So next Sunday, we will um, honor those who have passed away in the last year and invite others who wish to come forward and light a candle in memory of their loved ones. Uh, following that, well, not following that because Saturday comes before Sunday. The Saturday morning will be the veterans breakfast here at 9 a.m. If you are a veteran, please call right away to make a reservation. We hope to see you. Um, the Holiday Bazaar will be the following weekend on Saturday from 9 to 2. And then new this year, instead of a Christmas open house, Reverend Cindy and I will be hosting a gratitude gathering. This sounds like a lovely idea. This is because every single Saturday and Sunday in December are full with church events. So we could not find one to have a December gathering. So this may become a new thing and hopefully will conflict less with all of the holiday busyness. So we're gonna have a gratitude gathering from two to five. It's an open house up at the camp in Ringe and we, we will do everything. Just come and grace us with your presence and let us be grateful together for our church family. Um, coming up on November 22nd, we have the day at Wendy's. It's a Friday, so breakfast, lunch, or dinner. The only key is you have to have the slip. But if you don't have the slip, and we'll start putting them in the bulletins uh, the week before that, um, you can take a picture and show it on your phone, and they'll still give, and it's 30%, so it's a decent donation. We usually make at least a couple hundred dollars, and every little bit helps. So we hope we'll see you at Wendy's that day. Coming up, Pat is still looking for vendors. I have to tell you, Pat sent me an email. She's not here today. She says, I will still speak on Sunday, even though I will not be there. You can be my voice. <laughs> so I'm not only a Tostito chip, I'm Pat Darby. <laughs> there are 17 vendors so far, and there were 24 last year. So she's hoping to get at least seven or eight more. Um, and she'd like us, of course, to spread the word, both for vendors and for the event. And Mrs. Claus will be there all day to decorate cookies, to do crafts with the children, or any of the adults as well. So we hope we'll have lots of folks um, signing up and attending the vendor fair on December 7th. Uh, Caprice is downstairs busy this morning, but she also, now I'm Caprice, she also asked me to announce the shoebox collection. Um, she has these wonderful handouts down there right outside her office. Um, we usually put together 50 shoeboxes to donate overseas. And so um, a lot of the two of the min uh, ministry teams, Missions and Women's Fellowship, both support the shipping of these items heavily as well as some purchasing. And so if people can donate some of the items on this list, uh, they will be putting them together in early November. So we hope you will pick up a sheet and bring in even one thing helps. So anything people can do. Are there any other announcements this morning? Yeah. We do need a little extra help for the two events on community meal on Friday <coughs> and the Veterans Breakfast on Saturday. <laughs> Great. Are there any others this morning? Yes, Alex. Today is my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Alex. <laughs> and let us see the fourth in our Peace Across the Divide video together. If you are my sibling, then this family's in trouble. No kidding. What in the world are you thinking? What if you really hate me? What if we never find common ground? I cannot imagine getting beyond this divide. I'm not sure I'm willing to work to repair all of this.
Let us take a deep breath together. The rhythm of our breath and our heartbeat is the same. Our desire for life and love is the same. Our desire for a peace in which we flourish is the same. Let this moment permeate our souls and let us pass the peace of Christ between us. This peace is meant for all people. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another. This is the series that invites us to extend ourselves beyond the divisions we feel in this world. This week, we consider what it means to respect each other, irrespective of our differences. Aretha Franklin sang, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me. And she convinced us that it means a lot. Sometimes we think having respect means to agree or be the same. But that's not actually what the depth of respect is about. It comes from the Latin respectus, which means the act of looking at one often to consider, to observe. We are called to respect by tending to one another, regarding each other, considering each other early and often. The reality is that common ground sometimes isn't possible. And so as we live on uncommon ground, what can we do to keep tending one another to one another as family worthy of respect despite our differences? Let us sing together our meditation song. I'd invite Ray to offer and lead us in the invocation. <laughs> well, the act of simply coming together is revolutionary, which in its earliest form meant finding a course around <coughs> the central point. We gather around the light of Christ as the center and, and guiding light of our lives. This becomes our point of reference for our relationships and our love in the world. This is our respect revolution. Let us pray. God of all of us, we ask you to hover close. For we are divided world, and we should in this moment bind us as a love and invite us to do unto others in ways that build up the kingdom as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the center that holds, and in the power of the Spirit that transforms, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So our spirit sighting this morning is more of a sharing of a story that both Reverend Cindy and I uh, were a part of um, a week ago. And that was that when she and I went to see Florence Copeland 
two days before she passed. Although confined to bed at that point, her mind was still fairly sharp, but focusing on one specific thing. And the one thing that she could not get out of her mind was the story of the big coffee urn she donated to the church several years ago, probably six or seven, I remember when it came. And her greatest concern in that moment, no matter what else was said, she kept cycling back to being grateful that somebody could use something she gave. And it was such a moment for all of us because it became so clear that no matter what else in our lives, in her last cognitive moments, all she could think was and pray was that she had been useful, that she had made a difference and focused on one small act over and over and kept repeating, I'm just so glad someone else could use what I gave. And isn't that what we're all called to do? And isn't that what we all hope will be the case? Don't we all pray that we will be remembered with a story or an item or an act that we have done that some little thing, no matter how small, made a difference in somebody's life and thus made a difference in our world that will be carried on and remembered long after we're gone. So I can credit this moment and this gift of this message to Florence, who is no longer here with us, but who lives on. Amen.
studying scripture each week, we consider the ways that our spiritual ancestors dealt with their own time of division. Together we find ways to tell deeply good news for all people in our day by filtering our interactions through the lens of respect. Today's scripture describes how dependent we are on one another, that we all have a part to play. And the reality is that humanity was created to help one another. What we put into the world is part of the ongoing creation of the world. Will we respect our dependence upon one another, especially the kind that we are, that we are to know <laughs> as Christians connected as the body of Christ? Let us hear the message from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 26. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To, to each is given the, the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, another to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of powerful deeds, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots each one individually just as the spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the, all the members of the body through many are one body, so it is Christ. For it is one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, Slaves are free, and we all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And, in, and if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But it, as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. If all were single members, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with great honor. And, uh, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. 
but God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no d dissension within the body, but, but, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all joys together. A word of peace for our times. Thanks be to God. Excuse me, I've got to get my costume right. Yes. A manager of a company used to boss his employees around. He often nagged at his staff members and insisted that they should show him more respect. One morning, he brought a sign that read, I am the boss, and he hung it on his office door. Later, he returned after his lunch break only to find a note taped to it, and the note said, your wife called, she wants her sign back. <laughs> and Dominic, if you're listening, I hope you're laughing over that one too. <laughs> Excuse me. So we're all having fun today. And I know it's hard to take a jar of salsa, hot and spicy though she may be, seriously. But our message is important, so I hope that we can, for a moment, bring it to a place of paying attention and really hearing the message this morning. So we've spent the past several Sundays trying to wrap our heads around the various ways that we can come together as, in unity as human beings, as Christians, and as Americans. There is no question that we live in divided times, unfortunately, nor can there be any doubt at all that the media, in all of its forms, has amplified the angry rhetoric of not only our politicians, but social media platforms now mean that every single person feels freer to express their opinions on issues and candidates as boldly and sadly, as rudely as their keyboard allows. We have explored how kindness and compassion and humility can be practiced to help bring us closer to one another and our fellow citizens. But what happens when it becomes impossible to find that common ground? When we are so far apart in our thinking from our neighbor that we find ourselves living in that uncommon ground? When all else fails, when we are unable to come to a compromise position, or when we can't force ourselves to collaborate closely with others whose beliefs and opinions are too opposite from our own, what can we still do to live as Jesus has taught us? There is one word that changes the game, respect. It is rather simple when using mere words, but it seems just ridiculously challenging to put it into practice sometimes, doesn't it? And yet I'd like to ask you, why? Why is it so hard to respect others regardless of whether or not we agree? Has our society come to a place where we've given one another permission to be disrespectful to individuals solely based upon who they are voting for or what key issue they approve of? Sadly, it sure seems that way, doesn't it? And in many circles, unfortunately, it's being sold to us as biblical, to take a stand and not back down. But somehow that has been interpreted as don't show respect to those who are not like you. So let's take a moment together to see what the Bible actually says about respecting others, and maybe we can answer the age-old debate about whether someone has to earn your respect or not. In Matthew 7, 12, 12 we hear, hear this, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. So I don't know about you, but I hear nothing there about treating others as you'd like to be treated only if you agree with them. In Titus 2.7, we hear, in all things, offer yourself as a model of good works, and in your teaching, offer integrity and gravity. 
Here we are told to be a role model, not to selectively decide when we can be respectful or not. But instead, we are to do so in all things and at all times. Interestingly, also in Matthew 5, 42 to 48, we are instructed, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise up on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than anybody else? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Oh, we know we can't quite pull that off, but we can try. But wow, listen to this part again. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Indeed, loving those who love us, showing those respect who also respect us, that's easy, isn't it? But loving and showing respect to those who disdain us or who are disrespectful toward us, now that, that is revolutionary. And it's a powerful way to invite peace into any situation. You see, God isn't concerned about us getting even or balancing who we show respect to. Instead, we are invited to be an example to all, to Christians and non-Christians. We are to be the standard bearer, not the ones who ensure a tit-for-tat sort of existence. We bring about change by being that change, not by entering into the fray with the same rude behavior, the snide comments, but by being kind, humble, gracious, and accepting that there will always, always be those who disagree with us. But the very fact that they too are God's beautiful and precious child means that every single human deserves to be treated with respect and dignity regardless of our personal opinion. My opinion and your opinion about someone else, their beliefs, their candidate, God doesn't care about that. In fact, I would say, go so far as to say that God cares very little about how we view a person, but what God does care very much about is how we behave toward another person. Part of the problem with being human is that we don't easily have the kind of wider lens to see the world and others through that God does. Think about an eagle or a bird of prey. Their field of vision is much wider than ours is, and that's by design so that they can see their predators more easily, as well as hunt with greater success. But the human eye, it's limited in its field of vision much like the human mind can also be very, very limited in what it understands. You see that very person who is held in contempt by one person might very much be God sent in the life of another. Much like our scripture passage today reminds us, we are all created by God, but for very different purposes. Yes, even that individual who holds very different values was created by your God and is not evil. They are merely different. That very difference might be the perfect fit for a particular need in the world. Much like the Catholics are terrific at establishing hospitals and schools, the Baptists are appealing to those who appreciate a more personal conversion experience. Lutherans and Methodists are way bigger into Bible study, while UCCers like us tend to focus more on social justice. Every denomination has it fills a niche, and every Christian finds what works for them in particular settings. 
No approach or specialty is wrong. It's just different from what we may specifically value as highly. But respect is not the only, and not only the great equalizer, it is also the great recognizer. Through our, through our, through our respect of others, solely because they exist as God's beloved one, regardless of their official faith beliefs or political beliefs, or their lack of faith, we begin to widen our vision and see that everyone was created for a different purpose and that we desperately need the variety of perspectives and the different approaches of tackling problems. And if God treasures all these diverse opinions and beliefs, why shouldn't we? Respect is the bridge that helps both sides cross the chasm that divides us all. Without respect as part of our communal contract with one another, we devolve into a society that, well, it looks like what we have before us today, doesn't it? A society where individuals think their opinions must be inflicted on others, as if each individual is Solomon himself. It creates a culture of not just disrespect for differences, but as we are seeing and have seen over the past couple of decades, it also leads to anger and bitterness and distrust based solely on the fact that someone might seek a different approach to a problem solve, to, to problem solving a problem than we would. That's all it is. You see, the general lack of respect we are seeing in our communities these days is due to thinking it is appropriate to attack another person rather than the idea that they have. None of us are better off with this sort of separation we are seeing in America today. Instead, we are all very much limited by it. So I'm gonna tell you a story. There was a young boy named Daryl Davis and he was ten, a 10 year old Cub Scout and right here in Belmont, Mass. In 1960, 1968, his pack participated in a parade where Daryl was carrying the American flag for the Cub Scouts. As this young African American boy was pelted with bottles and rocks, he was absolutely stymied as to why his race alone incited such a vicious response. This incident led to what would become part of his lifelong personal ministry, as his intense curiosity caused him to research and explore as much as possible. Why are some people holding racist attitudes? As Davis grew to adulthood, he not only became a world-class blues pianist, playing gigs with the likes of B.B. King and Bo Diddley, among others, in 1983, he found himself sitting in a white country and western bar in Maryland where he was performing when a white patron came up to him to compliment him and struck up a conversation. Over a drink, the gentleman admitted eventually that he was actually a member of the KKK. Yet, through their love of blues, the pair formed an unlikely friendship. Davis began to see a way toward building a bridge by having respectful conversations with other KKK members, learning about their pasts and discovering how many of them were brainwashed in their youth into despising black people. None of these KKK participants had ever really had an opportunity to even get to know a black person will. They had always been kept at a distance by the instant and immediate lack of respect that they projected so in their minds, African Americans were categorized as unworthy, despite a complete lack of experience with them. Through these conversations, during which Davis asked questions with great deference and listened humbly and respectfully to their responses, some of those emotional walls began to be torn down. One brick at a time, he dismantled and disarmed the mindset of many KKK members who left the Klan and their prejudice behind. Let's hear Davis for a moment here. Ralph, you play the video. Daryl Davis. I am a musician by trade, but for decades now, I have traveled the country asking Ku Klux Klan members a simple question. 
How can you hate me when you don't even know me? To understand someone, you have to talk with them. I never respected the things these clan members said, but I respected their right to say them. And over time, through the power of conversation, I would help change their minds. A lot of times we don't agree with everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I'll respect him to sit down and listen to him. Eventually, many would leave the clan. I have collected over 200 clan robes, hoods, and other racist items given to me by people whose minds I have helped to change. When two enemies are talking, they aren't fighting. It's when the talking ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. That's why we need groups like FIRE to protect our freedom of speech, because without our words, we will never eradicate hate from our world. Respect should never have to be earned, as our many scripture passages remind us today. But it certainly will never be earned if we respond back to our tormentors with disrespect. Grace and humility combined with equal respectful treatment and a respectful landscape can help us find paths toward collaboration and connection. Without respect, we have the kind of social engagements that we see today. And absolutely nothing is accomplished while resentment reigns. Davis put into practice the very thing we are talking about. We don't have to be standing on common ground in order to offer respect to others. And just as Davis himself discovered along with the KKK members who eventually left the Klan, sometimes we have to step onto uncommon ground and remain there long enough and respectfully enough in order to discover our shared common ground. And I'm sorry, but if Daryl Davis can sit across the table from KKK members and listen to them respectfully, how can we not sit across the table from those who disagree with us politically and listen with respect? Who knows? We might just find there is an inch of common ground after all. Amen. As we come together now in prayer, I have several prayer requests already. I have a prayer request for Heather's Tim for coming to church and the church hasn't burst into flames. <laughs> Nobody's claiming to have written that. Um, prayers, prayers for Doc and for Susan, who lost their family cat last night. Certainly. Certainly prayers for you. Prayers for Jim Wozner as he flies to California on Tuesday for a month with family. Prayers for all of those loved ones who are in heaven. I'd also like to ask prayers for Judy Rathburn, who is now moving into a phase of dialysis and needs our prayers and support. Um, I'd also like to ask prayers for my daughter's boyfriend, Talon, who had a rugby injury yesterday and has broken the orbital socket of his eye. So prayers for him as he recovers and as he sits out the rest of the season. Um, I also have a prayer request this morning uh, from Mary Marshall. Prayers for her nephew, Troy. Uh, Troy has been, uh, sadly, estranged from the family for many years and has just re-entered and reconnected with everyone. And tragically, this week, was on a motorcycle when a car hit him. He is now in the hospital. He was visiting his mother in Florida, and things don't look good at all for him. So prayers for Troy and for their entire family during this difficult time. Are there other joys or concerns you wish to lift up this morning? Certainly the family of Fran Britt and the family of Florence Copeland. Prayers for Alex's neighbor. He saw an ambulance outside their house, so prayers for 
whatever they most need today. We've also been praying for the last few weeks for Michael's boss's mother, and she did pass away this week. So prayers for Michelle and her family. Prayers for Ron Fournier, who has also broken his hip. Absolutely. Prayers for those who, have, who are homeless and live in uncertainty. Prayers for Jennifer, who's struggling recovering from surgery, both physically and mentally. Let us come together now, first in a time of silence, then in a prayer of the people. Let us be together in prayer. Loving and ever-present God, we know that healing is possible, but we know that in all kinds of healing, staying the course takes a lot of effort. At times, we are more or less successful at offering an alternative narrative to fear and division as the body of Christ. But we come to you this morning, O oh God, as those who lament that common ground is not easily found. We find ourselves at times off balanced, disheveled from navigating the life of rocky and uneven paths and sometimes gaping potholes that threaten to swallow up our best efforts. In this moment, O oh God, help us be reminded to honor each person's attempt at making sense of sometimes senseless circumstances. Help us always, O oh God, to respect the efforts, even if we don't all see eye to eye about the kind of effort required. And so, O oh God, in this common ground moment, we bring together the prayers of the people, for when there is suffering or joy, we all are part of the body that experiences it. This morning, O oh God, we pray for Judy as she recovers from her broken hip. We pray for Talon as he recovers from his injury. We pray for Judy as she begins a rigorous dialysis process. We pray for Troy and his injuries that you may be with him and the family during this difficult time. We pray for our neighbors, those we know, those we see being taken in an ambulance, those we have never met. We pray for Sandy as she enters into hospice. We pray for Jennifer as she struggles with her recovery in many ways. We pray for Ron and his broken hip. We pray for Amanda and for all struggling with colds and flu and those struggling with mental health or homelessness, financial or other kinds of insecurities and uncertainties in their lives. We pray this day, O oh God, for Bobby's safety and for the safety of all who serve in the military. This week, O oh God, we pray for safe travels for Jim, and we pray for those who have gone before us. We pray for the family of Fran, for the family of Michelle's mom, for the family of Florence, for the Nelson family, and we pray, O oh God, for the loss of beloved pets and for those who are mourning them. Loving and gracious God, in all times and all places, we come to you. And I invite all of you to respond to these prayers by saying, when I pause, for ourselves and others. We pray for a sense of stability for ourselves and others. We pray for safety on the journey for ourselves and others. We pray for the spiritual capacity for respect for ourselves and others. 
and we pray for transformation of suffering to joy. For ourselves and others. Loving God, we lift up these prayers to you, knowing that you hear them and you will answer them in your time in the ways best for each of us. Amen. As we now think about all that we have received, let us give freely as we collect this morning's offering.
I'd like us now to join in singing the first three verses of our closing hymn, Oh for a Word. show you the way to do unto others with respect. May the Christ whose light is the center of all that is ground you in the assurance that no one is outside of love. May the Spirit show forth through you in extraordinary acts that you never imagined you had the power to achieve. And may you know the peace that surpasses all understanding, especially when it is most difficult to understand. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Find out what it means to me. R E S P E C T. Take care, T C B. What you want, you know I got it. What you need, you know I got it. All I'm asking is more than a respect when you come home. Find out what it means to me. R E S P E C T. Take it to me. 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 Whoa. A little respect. 